every part of Great Britain has a famous story behind it. And here in Great Britain, we're indeed spoilt when it comes to history. The County of Lancashire, of course, has always been well known for a most amazing story called the Pendle Witch Trials of 1612. Let's have a look at the whole story. At that period of time, we'd just lost a magnificent queen called Queen Elizabeth I. She died in 1603 and was replaced by a completely different character of the name of King James VI of Scotland, who then became King James I of England. This man was absolutely paranoid about witchcraft. He not only believed that wits existed, he believed they were actually out to get him. He blamed witchcraft and Catholicism for the gunpowder plot of 1605. He blamed witchcraft on the fact his wife couldn't get from Denmark to marry him. So therefore, on becoming King of England, he wrote a book called The Demonology Book. And you can buy that book today from any leading bookshop in paperback form. It covers his paranoia relating to witchcraft. Throughout the whole length of Great Britain, the area known as the Forest of Pendle was very, very remote. It was very, very isolated away from most towns and areas. And to this very day, is still a very isolated part of Great Britain. In the forest, you come across little clearings like Blackhoe, Barley, Newchurch, and Roughly, the home of the famous Pendle Witches. Our story starts way back in March that year, living at a place called Malkin Tower. It was a lady commonly known as Demdike. Her real name was Elizabeth Southern. She had a daughter called Elizabeth Devise, and she had three children, James, Jeanette, and Alison Devise. They lived at a place called Malkin Tower. Now, Malkin Tower sounds grand, doesn't it, really? But it was indeed a one-roomed limestone hovel, and I think hovel is the best way to describe it. Living nearby was another elderly lady of the name of Anne Whittle, commonly known as Bessie Chuttox. Both Anne Whittle and Elizabeth Southern were over 85 years old. They'd somehow defied the laws of nature because life expectancy, if you were lucky, would be 35. These two women hated each other with a vengeance because they were both involved in the same trade, which was making herbal remedies in the summertime. And in the wintertime, they'd have to beg and they'd work against each other. It was said that Anne Whittle once broke into Malkin Tower and stole an item of clothing and a bag of meal. There was no love between these two families. In the case of Bessie Chattox, she lived in New Church in Pendle with her daughter, Anne Redfern. On the 18th of March, 1612, when young Alison devised, she's 14 years of age, she's the granddaughter of Elizabeth Southern, living at Malkin Tower. She left the cottage and she walked along the length of Pendle Hill, beneath the shadow of the hill, towards a place called Cone, a town in North Pendle. And from Cone, she walked along the forest pathways towards Trawden, another little town very nearby. On that journey, she had the misfortune of meeting a Halifax peddler called John Law. When I say peddler, John Law was basically a walking salesman, a large pack in his back full of 1612 luxuries. He would go from village to village, selling his wares. He was almost like a walking newspaper. He would bring information from each village as he made his way into it. Alison begged of him. Oh, please, sir, please, sir, can you spare a few pins to pin me clothing together? Get away with you. I'm not taking me back off for you, lass. You got no money, you're no use to me. Oh, please, sir, you can spare just a couple of pins to pin me clothing together. Get away with you. I'm not taking me back off for you, lass. You ain't got no money. According to John Law, the Halifax peddler, out of the forest pathways, out of the bracken and the heather, appeared a huge black dog with snarling white teeth and glowing red eyes, and the dog sat next to Alison. The dog turned to look at Alison, and the dog talked. Alison, I can lame him for you. Lame him! Lame him! shouted young Alison. Law felt this terrible pain down his left arm and left leg, and collapsed in agony on the forest pathway. He lay there for a good five hours. The kind people of Cone could see him. They got a stretch of party together and they carried him down to an old alehouse which has long, long since gone in the market of Cone called the Greyhound Inn. There the landlord John Edrington spoon fed him, cleaned him and as Law's voice returned he shouted, Be cursed! Witch in the forest, the young lass with a dog. I swear to you, I swear to you, I heard the dog talk. She's in league with devil. Please send letters back to me family. Edrington wrote letters back to the city of Halifax, and John Law's eldest son, Abraham, received the first letter. Hey, my father's in trouble, I better go and collect him. 
He set her from Halifax, arrived in Cone, and walked into the old Greyhound Inn, and saw his father in a twisted and contorted state. Uh, father, uh, what's happened to you? you? You look terrible, man. Abraham, I've been cursed. I met this young lass with a dog. She's called Alison Diva. She's got a dog with you. I swear to you, I heard the dog talk. She's a witch, lad. She cursed me. I want you, lad, to go and find her. Bring her here. Reverse the curse. Well, Abraham must have been quite a brave boy. He left the old inn, walked up to the slopes of Pendle Hill and deep into the forest of Pendle. There he came across a clearing and a place called Bull Hole. And there he found this little cottage by itself, a one-roomed limestone cottage with smoke belching from a chimney in the roof. He hammered on the door. The door opened and there was James Device, Alison Device's brother. Uh, can you help me, sir? I want to see Alison Device. My father wants to see her. Uh, where is she? Uh, in here, sir. Alison came to the door. Right, lass, you're coming with me, shouted Abraham. And he dragged her through the forest of Pendle, down into Cone, where she made eye contact with John Law, the Halifax peddler, on his bed in the Greyhound Inn. Law looked up and shouted, It's you! You're a witch! You cursed me last, didn't you? That dog you had, I heard it talk, you're a lingering devil, aren't you? This 14-year-old girl, on bended knees, begged and begged and begged forgiveness. She had no idea, but she just admitted to a state capital offence of witchcraft. And strangely enough, John Law, the Halifax peddler, was about to forgive her, but not his son Abraham. Oh no, oh no, we'll have you for this. I'm gonna go and get magistrates. And in doing so, he opened the 1612 Pendle Witch Trials. The local magistrate was called Roger Noel. He lived in the village of Reed near Burnley in a beautiful hall called Reed Hall. He had read the Book of Demonology, which the king had written, and was fully aware of the king's paranoia relating to witchcraft. He also knew if he could incriminate this young girl, he was going to carry favour with none other than the King of England personally. So therefore, Alison was arrested by the sheriffs of the forest and brought to Reed Hall, Burnley, where she burst into tears and for the second time inside 24 hours, begged and begged forgiveness for laming John Law, the Halifax peddler but she gave Roger Noel a lot more information. Um, me grandmother, damn dyke, she's a witch. Uh, so's Bessie Chaddox and her daughter Anne Redfern. We are familiars, sir. Uh, familiars? said Roger Noel. Yes, sir. Dogs, Tib, Ball, Fancy, Dandy. These dogs, sir, that came to us at different times of our lives and said, look, we can give you special powers, but in return we need to suckle from your flesh and take your souls. They're our familiars, sir. We also make clay pictures, sir. Clay pictures? said Roger Noel. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, people, sir. We make them from clay. We have used hair and teeth from New Church Cemetery, sir. We then crumble the clay picture over the fire, sir, and people die, sir. Roger Noel. The local magistrate wasn't scared. He was actually delighted. He had a confession. He immediately made arrangements to see Elizabeth Southern, Anne Whittle, commonly known as Demdike and Chattox, and uh, Anne Whittle's daughter, Anne Redfern. He met them, had them arrested. They were brought to Reed Hall, Burnley, where they met young Alison. The huge amount of information that was coming to Roger Noel's ears absolutely fascinated him. Remember, Demdike hated Chattox and they tried to blame each other. Redfern was quite shocked and Alison Device was convinced that she had indeed lain John Law, the Halifax peddler. So in doing so, the four of them actually admitted to witchcraft and they made the long journey through the beautiful trough of Boland down to the city of Lancaster where they were thrown into what we call the Well Tower at Lancaster City Castle. It's a deep, 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 deep dungeon. So deep that not even a chink of light can get down there. There they were chained to the floor in absolutely appalling conditions. And there they would wait until August of that year for their trials to begin. In the meantime, back on the slopes of Pendle Hill, in the little cottage called Malkin Tower, Elizabeth was very worried about her daughter, Alison Device, and she organised on Good Friday 1612 what has gone down in history as the Good Friday Meeting. The whole idea of this meeting was to get a potion together to blow the gates of Lancaster City Castle open and rescue their loved ones. They also got a large cooking vessel called a cauldron. Alison's brother James slaughtered the sheep from the fell. They dined on fresh mutton. 
They then got the cauldron bubbling. The black liquid inside began to bubble and steam, and into that black bubbling liquid went crushed powdered human teeth, the odd clay pitcher, and we are told the odd human scalp. The whole idea was to get a potion together to blow the gates of Lancaster City Castle open and rescue their loved ones. However, nothing happened. But what did happen is word of the Good Friday meeting reached the ears of Roger Noel, and he gave orders that every single person who would attend that meeting should be arrested immediately. When word filtered into the forest of Pendle, Isabel Sidegrove, Lawrence Hay, Elizabeth Astley, Barbara Howgate, and Christopher Howgate, they just literally disappeared. In doing so, they saved their lives. The ones that were successfully arrested were Elizabeth Device, James Device, Jeanette Device, Jeanette Preston of Gisborne, John and Jane Bullcock, and this very, very brave lady called Alice Nutter. They were all sent to Lancaster with the exception of the two Jeanettes. Jeanette Preston came from Gisborne, West Yorkshire, so therefore she was sent to the city of York and paraded in front of the York City Magistrates. Her husband went with her, villagers went with her, and they begged for her release. Her husband was told, I'm sorry, the king has signed her death warrant. At her trial, she was found guilty of, first of all, attending the Good Friday meeting in the Forest of Pendle in Lancashire, but also guilty of the murder of her employer, Mr. Thomas Lister. She'd been nursing him. He had died. She wrapped his body in a clean white sheet ready for burial. And two days before the burial, she touched the sheeting and some fresh blood came from the sheets. This was classed as witchcraft, and she became the very, very first of the Pendle witches to be executed in the city of York in July of that year. The youngest of the Devise family, Jeanette Devise, was a little girl. She was sent to live with the local magistrate, Roger Noel. For the first time in her life, she was given three meals a day, a lovely warm bed to sleep in, nice clothes to wear, and she was only too happy. Four months later, to give evidence against her entire family due to the kindness that had been given to her by the local magistrate. Roger Noel was very delighted. He wrote to the King of England and said, Sir, I have witches waiting to be tried in the city of Lancaster. The King wrote back and said, Mr Noel, Sir, I am delighted. I shall send two circuit judges, James Ortham, Edmund Bromley, a young boy called Thomas Potts. He will record all the evidence and you, sir, can bring your own evidence in as well, sir. Well, the trials began in August of that year. There was a jury, but there was no defence counsel because no one dared take on the King of England. So the prosecution consisted of James Oltham, Edmund Bromley, Thomas Potts, Roger Noel, and two other magistrates, William Holden and John Bannister. Before the trials began, Demdike, or Elizabeth Southern as we know her, she died due to the terrible harsh treatment that had been taking place down in the cells. The food was disgraceful, the conditions were very harsh, and for a lady over 85 years old, lying in her own waist on a cold floor, took its toll. In her absence, she was found guilty of the murder of Richard Asherton, the child of Richard Baldwin and Henry Mitten. A classic case would be when she made her way to Burnley with her granddaughter, Alison, and they would link arms because Demdark was practically blind. They could smell the lovely aroma of fresh bread being baked. They went onto Richard Baldwin's land, he was a miller, he was grinding flour, and they begged a loaf of bread of him, just one loaf of bread. He shouted, get off my land, you're not welcome. He had a little daughter in a cot, and Baldwin mentioned in the trials that he'd seen both Demdike and Elizabeth turn and look at the baby girl and shout, if you don't give us some bread, we shall curse the little girl. Well, the little girl did die, but two years later, and the mortality rate for children was very, very high at that period of time. So she was found guilty of the murder of Richard Ashton, the child of Richard Baldwin, and Henry Mitten. Next person brought up from the cells was the poor, unfortunate Anne Whittle, commonly known as Old Chattox. She was a terrible sight. She was covered in her own excrement and urine. She'd been lying on this cold floor in chains, and she was suffering terribly from malnutrition. Her teeth were chattering away, and many people believed that because of this chattering sound from her teeth, that she was nicknamed Chattox. She was found guilty of the murder of Robert Nutter, John Device, Anne Nutter, John Moore, and Hugh Moore, which she made a plea of not guilty, but was found guilty by the courts there. Next person brought up was Catherine Hewitt of Cone. She was found guilty of the murder of Anne Folds of Cone. She had bewitched this woman. 
Next person was Elizabeth Devise. Now, Elizabeth was probably the most ugliest person in the court that day. One eye looked up, one eye looked down. She too was covered in her own waist and not a pleasant sight to look at. In fact, she scared quite a few people, including the jury, and they had no hesitation in finding her guilty of the murder of John Robinson, James Robinson, and Henry Mitten. Her son, James Devise. James was in a terrible state of health. In fact, the jury wondered whether he'd been tortured. He was lapsing in and out of consciousness. He was suffering from severe malnutrition and looked like he had some terrible bruises to his face. He could hardly stand. He was being held by two warders. He was found guilty of the murder of Anne Townley, John Hargreaves, Blaise Hargreaves, John Duckworth. But he had also incriminated himself. He had told the magistrates before his trial that if he went to Malkin Tower, this little cottage, and started digging in front of the front of the door, he would unearth a clay pitcher which was found and brought into court. The clay pitcher did have human teeth and human hair. Next person up was Chad's daughter, Anne Redfern. She was also found guilty of the murder of Christopher Nutter. In the court that day, with three people that many historians believe were totally innocent of the crimes against them. To make sure that things were going the way the Mastic wanted to, he had his star witness, the little girl, Jeanette Device. She'd been brought into court that morning wearing a lovely white dress and a lovely white bonnet. She was picked up and put on top of the desk so the jury could see her. And there she shouted, My grandmother's a witch! My mother's a witch! So's my brother! So's my sister! Her mother, Elizabeth, shouted, Stop it! Stop it, Jeanette! You don't know what you're saying! Have my mother removed from the court, sir! She's upsetting me! And her mother was indeed removed from the court. And there, young Jeanette told how she'd seen these dogs, Tib, Ball, Fancy, Dandy, which was basically the devil in disguise, come to a place like Malkin Tower, and how she'd seen them suckle from the flesh, leaving marks in the bodies, etc. And how they'd made these clay pictures and how they'd selected victims and cursed them. The jury took this all in. That's when Roger Noel, for the second time that morning, picked her up and put on the desk and pointed at John and Jane Bullcock and Alice Nutter. These three were basically landowners. John and Jane were farmers, a mother and son, hard-working farmers from the village of Black O, which is very near New Church in Pendle. And Alice Nutter, she came from Roughly. What made these three quite unique is that they were reasonably well-educated. And in the case of Alice Nutter, she was extremely well-educated. Now, the three of them, apparently, it has been said, never confirmed or denied that they had gone to see Roger Noel, nothing to do with witchcraft whatsoever, but to do with land disputes. Land was disappearing, land was shrinking, fences pushed back, horses, cattle stolen. And way back in 1612, women were not allowed to possess a brain. Women suffered terribly in this country. By far the most famous of all these so-called witches was indeed Alice Nutter. Alice lived in Roughly at a gorgeous building, which is still there to this very day, called Roughly Hall. Now, she had had words with her husband about land disputes, etc. He had seen Roger Noel, but he'd done nothing about it. John Bullcock had seen him, he'd done nothing about it. So therefore, Alice made the rather sad decision of going to Lancaster by herself. It has been said, never confirmed or denied, that she walked into a court session to the words of, it's a woman, a woman, get her out. A woman has dared to enter the, the courts. Get her out. She grabbed hold of the furniture, but would not let go of her grip. The cinema director said, well, uh, let her have her say. In one day, Alice Nutter won all her land disputes fairly and squarely. And as she left Lancaster as a free woman that day, with all her lands restored to her home, in the court behind her was a fuming, fuming Roger Noel. How dare this woman go over my head? She's embarrassed me in front of the senior magistrates. I need revenge. I've also got John and Jane Bullcock who've been causing me problems. How can I get rid of them? Well, he had the trump card up his sleeve, none other than young Jeanette Device. Jeanette was brought into the courts once again, and there she pointed to John and Jane Bullcock and Alice Nutter when Roger Noel said, Now then, these three people, John and Jane Bullcock and Alice Nutter, were they at your home in Malkin Tower on Good Friday? They were, sir. A look of shock and horror came across their faces as they realised they were being incriminated. In the case of John and Jane Bullcock, they were found guilty of turning a young girl called Jean Mead of Harrogate, West Yorkshire, completely insane. In the case of Alice, she was found guilty of aiding Demdike and Elizabeth Device in the murder of Henry Mitten. She made a plea of not guilty. It has been said, not confirmed or denied, 
that she said, Sir, I'm a woman of wealth. I don't need to beg. But on the jury's evidence of this little girl. And there she was found guilty of witchcraft. On the 20th of August, 1612, they were taken to the city of Lancaster's pillory area, laid out for execution. There they had to make their way to the pillory, ropes placed around their necks, and they stood on top of the rostrum. It has been said, never denied or confirmed, that as Alice turned to watch this huge crowd coming to watch the entertainment, she stared down from the pillory, and there she saw Roger Noel holding the hand of the young girl, Jeanette Device. Alice shouted, I shall haunt you for the rest of your life. And then the stools were kicked out from underneath them. These poor people did not hang. They literally strangled to death. Watching that day was young Jeanette Device. She watched her entire family die. She watched the landowners die. And as soon as they stopped twitching, Roger Noel said, Goodbye. What do you mean goodbye, sir? Surely I'm going back to that lovely warm house of yours, sir. He had used her, and she made the long, long journey from the city of Lancaster back to the slopes of Pendle Hill to a cold and empty cottage, knowing full well that her evidence had taken the life of her entire family. Some three years later, she was rearrested on a charge of witchcraft. A young boy called Edmund Robinson said he'd been walking through the forest of Pendle and came across young Jeanette actually committing acts of witchcraft. Of course, with the family reputation, it was taken very seriously. She was sent to Lancaster, then down to London to be examined by scholars and physicians, back up to Lancaster, down to London. And after three years of traveling up and down the country, that's when this young boy Robinson said, actually, I made it all up. What we do find amazing is when the snows come to Pendle Hill, the last piece of snow to melt is always in the perfect shape of a white witch. Do look it up on Google search, you'll find it there to this very day. As for the two circuit judges, James Altham, Edmund Bromley, they were both knighted. Roger Noel was made the High Sheriff of Lancashire, was also knighted. And Thomas Potts, the clerk to the courts that day, in 1613 wrote a book called The Wonderful Discovery of Witched in Lancashire that earned him a lot of money. As for the witches, well, I'm going to leave that with you. Were they witches or just unfortunate victims of a local magistrate and a king who was paranoid about witchcraft? We shall never, ever know.